Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Matthew Heinsen. I'm the acting head of school here at the Sydney Conservatory of Music. And thanks very much for coming along today for what I think is going to be, I hope is going to be a very provocative talk. Uh, I'll just let you know next, uh, the next music, uh, lecture in this about music series taking place on the 2nd of May is by composer Ivan Zavada. And he's going to be talking about the music which he's written for um, domes, very large domes in which uh, his music is played. So uh, if you're interested in knowing about this or the other uh, lectures we have in this series, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the hall and you can put your name down there and make sure you're informed about that. Also, I'd just like to let you know that uh, at the end of this lecture today, we're going to have refreshments out in the foyer. So please feel free to join us and, and talk to us there. So today's lecture will be given by Dr. Michael <coughs> Duke. And Michael Duke is a senior lecturer here at the Sydney Conservatory of Music in, uh, in saxophone. He completed his doctorate uh, with, in performance from Indiana University under the tutelage of renowned classical saxophonists Eugene Rousseau, Johnny Formo and Arno Bornkamp. And Ma uh, Michael is an Australian and he's performed extensively around the world. Uh, and he's recorded three CDs, which I thought we might have for purchase at the back at the end of today, but <laughs> it doesn't seem to be that way. Anyway, you can get in contact with Michael if you're interested in, in uh, purchasing some of these at, l at a later date. The topic of the presentation today, as you can see from up behind me, is the, the very provocative title, Performer versus Researcher. Uh, and Michael's going to talk about the process of research for his field, which is saxophone playing, particularly in when it comes to new music, right from the inception of a project through to its conclusion and even subsequent marketing. I know this personally because, uh, in fact, Michael and I were just talking a few minutes ago about a new saxophone quartet I'm writing for Michael, which is Michael's group, which have just started rehearsing today. So it's a very, very fresh topic, and I hope you do enjoy it. Please welcome Michael Duke. Thanks, Michael. Cheers. Thank you. So I think I have to perch back here and then you can hear me. Can you hear me? Good, great. So um, performer versus researcher. So uh, as Matthew um, told you, uh, I teach saxophone here at the university. And as far as my students are concerned, that's pretty much what I do. Um, it's not true. I do a lot more than that. Um, uh, other than raising three kids at home and everything else that everybody does in their lives, uh, my job is actually uh, really broken into three different components. There's the teaching component, which is meant to be 40% of our workload. There's the research component, which is another 40%. And then the, um, the service component, which is 20%. So 40, 40, 20 split. Um, which actually comes to, you know, quite surprising for a lot of my students. They have no idea um, that there's all this other stuff going on um, behind the scenes. And in particular, during the summertime, um, kids, they say, see you later, have a great summer. And they think that's it, I'm off at the beach. Um, well, I do go to the beach, but, uh, but in be only on, you know, in between times, most of the time what we're doing is we're working on our research because we don't have students to kind of, I suppose, um, I don't want to say distract, but to, uh, to get in our way of our research. We can um, focus on that. But it's not just at summer times either. Really, honestly, the research is happening constantly. Um, as a performer, it never stops. Um, in fact, right now, I'm researching. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. Um, at the end of this uh, talk, as part of this talk, I'm going to actually um, do a little bit of research right in front of your very eyes. So, uh, let me just think about this. Um, so let's see here, let's move on. What is research for a performer? Well really research in its traditional sense is going to be uh, things like writing books or doing a journal article or doing the forward to a book. And if that's what we all did, it would be very easy. The university would be happy and our lives would be a lot more straightforward. Um, but as performance uh, or performers, um, it's actually, uh, that's certainly definitely part of what we do, but it's often not the main thing of what we're doing. What I'm doing is um, creative work or creative outputs as research. So um, I certainly have contributed to articles that have been published. Um, I haven't, well, I did do a thesis. Uh, many of the uh, performance faculty 
have doctorates. Um, I, mine was on chamber music. Some of us have um, PhDs, some of us have DMAs, but we all have our hands in academia and in writing. So that's certainly part of what we do, but that's not really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, um, I suppose, taking our performing side and how we use that as research, or how, in particular, how I do that. So, um, you know, I, I often think about when I'm, my wife is a saxophone player, but she's also a, a doctor. And when we have um, guests over and, the, you know, the academics, the research um, people are, you know, very curious to see, oh, you're at the university, so what do you do? They find it hard, I suppose, to conceptualize what a performer, a, a, a player of music, in a, a, what they do, but also how that really translates into research. So oftentimes, you know, I think we get very good at kind of distilling down what it is um, that we do. Also, um, you know, even for the university, when we submit our um, submissions for our research, there's an external assessor that sits down and looks at it. We have no idea who they are. We have no idea what their background is, whether they know anything about music or they know nothing about music. And then we, on, on our written research, we have to explain basically why what we're doing is research. So um, that happens every year, and it's, a, it's an, sometimes an arduous task, but I suppose it makes us think about what we're doing. Okay, so let's have a look here. This is often what it feels like as a, a performer being a researcher. We're trying to stick that square peg in that round hole. At least anyway, that feels to us, um, at least to myself, a little bit like what the, the framework is at a university. Um, the conservatorium, wasn't always part of um, Sydney University. I think somebody told me the other day it was 1989, does that sound correct, that we amalgamated um, and we became part of the university. And I suppose at that point we had to start thinking about in terms of you know, university um, academia and how what we're doing is going to be part of the whole bigger framework. Um, so what we do is this. <laughs> We smash that peg until it fits. No, <laughs> no, 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 just that's a little uh, academic joke, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, what we're doing here is really, uh, we'll go to my next slide, university speak, is NTROs or non traditional research outputs. In other words, anything that's not a book, not a journal, not a forward in a book, but something that's a little bit outside the box. Um, so to read from the website, non-traditional research outputs, or NTROs, comprise a wide variety of outputs that differ in their form and, and mode of production. So NTROs can include anything from highly experimental works of creative art, music, or video, or visual art, for example, creative writing, dance, or design, through to scholarly editions and translations, website creation, and commission reports for government and non-government bodies. I have not been involved in any commissioning of reports for government bodies, <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, but really, I suppose to drill down a little bit more, um, what that means for, for me is this, original creative works or musical compositions. I'm not a composer, uh, but sometimes I do arrange music for ensembles, and those arrangements can be considered as, um, as research. Live performance of creative works, it's probably the biggest one for me in uh, bringing new music to life. Uh, recorded, rendered creative works, in other words, CDs, or we're even moving past CDs pretty quickly, just to pure digital formats. And, and then there's curated or produced substantial public exhibit exhibitions, so um, curating festivals and putting on those kind of things. So those, are, I suppose, are the four main frameworks within I work. Okay, the, 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 one of the biggest ones is what's called CW2, or Category 2 Live Performance of Creative Works. So this is, um, you know, basically, as you could imagine, uh, this is going to be performing a new piece of music, primarily it's new music, I should say, or a piece of music that's in existence that you are contributing something new to. So if I was to play um, a, a Mozart um, piano sonata, on saxophone, <laughs> and nobody's ever done that before, and I found a way to make it not sound horrible, um, that could possibly be considered uh, research. Um, but for me, often that's not terribly interesting to me. I think that it sounds perfectly fine as it is on the keyboard, 
and I'm looking for, um, for interactions and collaborations with, new, with composers and new music. So um, the definition of, uh, of this category that says, uh, I'll read it quickly, musical performance embodying research and undertaken on a systematic basis in order to increase the stock of knowledge or advance understanding in the context of the arts and humanities. Live performance of new and original works that extends knowledge and or develops the work and other creative artists and researchers in music and other fields. So um, sometimes that can also include premieres, as in, well, obviously the world premieres, but Australian premieres, music that has never been heard in this country. Um, okay, let's see the next category. Recorded or rendered creative works. This is something that, um, that I was interested in getting involved in anyway, regardless of whether it was considered research. I wanted to have uh, um, some commercially available CDs out there for my own career path. Um, so I was able to frame what I was doing within this research context. Um, you can't just, again, record anything. You can't record your favorite saxophone sonatas um, unless you're doing something new and innovative with those saxophone sonatas other than playing them. So primarily, it has to come from, uh, again, works that have been unrecorded, um, or, well, I suppose new music as well, but sometimes there's music that's been in existence that just hasn't been recorded yet. So rendered creative works is very important. Okay, the original sax researcher. Um, so to put it in the context of the saxophone in particular, um, the first saxophone researcher was this guy. Adolf Sax, the man who invented the instrument. So he had his 200th anniversary um, uh, in 2014, which kind of shows you that our instrument is very new. Um, does anybody have any idea when the saxophone was actually invented? You might, Josh, because you're my DMA student. 1846, yes, that's when it was patented, correct. <laughs> um, actually, when it was... Uh, when it was actually born or came into existence, we don't really know. Um, the saxophone was rumored to have been, um, was ready to be shown at an instrument exhibition in Brussels in 1838. And the story goes that one of the um, sax's rivals, who didn't like sax, came over and kicked as hard as he could this big sack that had an instrument in it and smashed it. And then sax was not able to, um, to, to bring out the instrument. So. Um, his life is a really interesting man. If you're bored someday, you should um, check him out. He, uh, he was bankrupt at least twice. Um, he, he almost died about three or four times um, as a child. Uh, he was in and out of litigation his whole life. There were people trying to claim that they had invented the instrument. It's an interesting character. Oh, I have another picture, just because I thought it was fun. Um, this was the Belgian Frank before it became the Euro. They love their out of sax and they, um, they celebrate him. Um, well, they used to celebrate him on, on their money. So, um, look, the instrument itself, like I said, is very new. It, it really, it, as far as I can work out, unless somebody can think of another instrument, it's kind of the, the, the latest or the last um, acoustic instrument um, that's been invented that's kind of been accepted in, in the wider musical community. Um, acoustic instrument, like not talking about electronic keyboards and things like that. We didn't quite make the cut for the orchestras. Um, Berlioz and his orchestration book was somewhere around 1840. Berlioz, by the way, loved the instrument and wrote glowingly about it. He just never really wrote any music for it, which is a bit of a problem. He did one arrangement of a piece and then that was lost, probably on purpose, I'm not sure. So Sax himself, other than being an inventor, what's really interesting about him is that he thought, oh, if I'm going to get these instruments off the ground, there's going to have to be repertoire that people can play. So he established his own publishing house. And, um, and that was, you know, late 1850s, um, you know, or 1850s through about the 1870s. He published over 200 works for not just the saxophone, but all of his instruments, the sax horns. He had an improved uh, bass clarinet. He had all kinds of weird and wonderful instruments, but of course the saxophone and the whole family of instruments. There was about, I think, something like 38 instrument, uh, compositions purely for the saxophone that he published. So he, as I'm saying, you know, really was the first, I suppose, proponent of the instrument, and if it wasn't for him, um, it would have been a very slow start, if, um, or maybe a very quick finish for the instrument. 
uh, the kind of composers that were writing for the instruments were people who were you know, close at hand, um, people like um, Closet, a high synth Closet, who was a virtuoso clarinetist. Um, there was Jean-Baptiste Sangelet, Jules de Mersimon, another uh, virtuoso flautist, and Joseph Arben. If there are any brass players in the room, you'd know that name in particular. So um, look, the, the, the type of music, is, some of it is, um, is okay. <laughs> some of it's a little bit um, old fashioned now, I suppose, in terms of that it was kind of um, parlor music or music to be played you know, in the parlor. Um, also, some of it was used as contest pieces at the, at the Paris Conservatoire. Some of the repertoire has survived and is still being played um, by my students as we speak. So, okay, let's see here. Um, I suppose in the context of the saxophone and it's, it's gaining acceptance, if you think about the clarinet, clarinet approximately invented around about 1700. It was about 90 years later, or it wasn't until about 90 years later, that Mozart wrote his, um, his, his uh, concerto, the K622. And that, I suppose, could really, you know, in some circles, is seen as kind of um, a, a pivotal moment in the clarinet's repertoire. And from that point on, it was definitely here to stay. The saxophone, like I said, around about 1846, 1838, somewhere around that, if you fast forward 90 years from then, you get to about the 1930s. And that's when our repertoire really kicked off. Um, there was definitely music before that time, but there was a real explosion um, at that point, primarily because there were some pretty amazing uh, performers who were out there cajoling composers to write for the instrument. Okay, so. Um, but really, you know, without these big name composers like your Mozarts and your Brahms and your Beethovens and your Schumanns, etc., the saxophone kind of struggled in its infancy to kind of to gain acceptance, I suppose, as a concert instrument. It really found its home in the military bands in France, um, and then obviously in America too, when Phil, uh, John Philip Sousa and, and Patrick Gilmore um, embraced the instrument. So I suppose what I'm getting at here is. Um, it's really been on the performers to kind of get things happening and to, to build a repertoire. And it's kind of in our DNA. Because we haven't been around forever, we can't sit back and, and, and um, just play the greats by the great composers because a lot of them didn't write for our instrument. The great composers for us are kind of lesser composers in the bigger um, scheme of things. Um, Jacques Hibert wrote some wonderful music. Um, we have uh, Paul Creston, American composer. We have Alexander Glazunov, wonderful composers, but not on the same pedestal, I suppose, as some of the so-called masters. So um, your saxophone player, your garden variety saxophone player, really knows how to organize. They really know how to hustle. They really know how to write grants. They really know how to contact festivals. And they really know, I suppose, basically how to make their own opportunities. Because we, don't, we can't rely on that orchestral position. We do play in orchestras, but once every six months. We don't really have a full-time, well, there is no real full-time position for a saxophone player outside of the military bands. If you live in Europe, some parts of Europe and America, those are fantastic jobs at a very high level of musicianship. Um, but, you know, that again, um, it's a bit difficult for the poor old saxophone player. So. There's a great example of a hustler, and I suppose I'm going to kind of talk about how I do that too. I don't see it in those terms of hustling, but I suppose that's really what it is. Um, let's flip over now to the next thing. Sorry if it's so small you can't read that. Um, but these are commissions. Um, I did a, a, a compilation of the commissions that I've, um, I've kind of been involved in or spearheaded since I've been here at the conservatorium. Um, Primarily, I'm really interested in working with Australian composers. For me, having studied, I spent a decade um, overseas living in America. And um, when I came back to Australia, I was like super excited about being back in the country again, but really discovering, all right, what is the Australian repertoire? And although there is some great music written for the saxophone um, by Australian composers, there really isn't a lot. And I kind of saw a need um, for, for the instrument in, and, and also for our identity as saxophone players and concert artists in Australia to have our own repertoire that we can, we can work with. So these are the composers. You can see um, Matthew's on the list there. Um, some of our uh, fantastic faculty, Anne Boyd, Michael Smetnan, um, some people such as Brenton Broadstock, who was the Dean and Head of Composition down at Melbourne University. We've been very lucky to work with lots of different composers. I've starred the ones, which is most of them there, 
This is HD Duo, and that's my um, duo that I perform with David Howie sitting there in the black. And I suppose I can't really claim them as mine. They're our pieces that we've both done together. They're both commissioned. Um, there's some, one piece that's a consortium there that was a bunch of saxophone players from around the world that got together to put that piece together. So it's, it's a long process doing commissioning uh, and you know from beginning to end, so I better get into it. We're going to run out of time. So it all starts, I suppose, um, by, uh, by uh, approaching a composer. So often David and I will kind of discuss, you know, who would we really love to have a work from? It's, it, you know, the type of music that we play is biased by our own um, opinions of whether we think it's good music or not. We won't approach a composer no matter how well known they are if we don't like the music because we're the ones that are going to have to play it. So, um, so we'll come up with a great idea and then often, you know, the easiest way or one of the best ways of con contacting a composer is if you know them. Um, it's terribly easy for me to bump into Matthew Heinsohn five times in a week and drop little hints <laughs> about pieces or concertos or um, to, it, it, he knows me and I know him and that just makes it a whole lot easier. He, if he um, doesn't, you know, despise me, then he might um, be interested in writing a piece. I hope that's not the case, Dave, um, Matthew. So um, sometimes it's not people that we know. Sometimes we approach people that we don't, um, and that comes, you know, in the form of emails or uh, or some or such. So you know, look, the composers. What are they interested in? They're really interested in. Um, you would think maybe money, but often no. What they're really interested in is performances. They want if they're going to go to all this effort of writing this piece, they want to know that it's going to get performed. So it's often best for us to approach a composer saying, look, we're, we've, we're going to apply to play at this festival or this conference, and we would really love to do a new work. Would you be interested in, in contributing? And um, if there's a performance and often a recording that's involved as well, that makes it an even sweeter deal for them because then they have something that they can show other performers. So, um, of course, you know, if you have a recording then too, um, uh, like I said, other performers might want to play, but also radio broadcasts. You can have a life beyond just that one performance. Um, and of course, money is important too. If you can find money um, uh, through grants or through uh, hook or by crook, that office, you know, it, they've got to make a living too, I suppose. You know, it's very important that we um, respect what they do and where possible, we try and do that. So the collaboration process in general, uh, what's that like? It's completely different with every composer that we've worked with. Um, some want absolutely nothing to do with us. Some want to ask us questions every step of the way. Some people micromanage everything. They write the piece and then we get it and, and it doesn't matter how we play it, they've got 15 comments on which way it should be. Others, you write, they write your piece and you play it for them. And they say, oh, I never thought it would sound like that. That's fantastic. That, they have this attitude of once I hand it over to the performer, that's it. It has a life of its own. So every personality is different and every composer is different. Um, I suppose that's what makes it interesting. So I suppose that the first thing that we usually have to decide is what instrument are we going to write for? Now, I know it's saxophone and piano, but there are at least four different types of saxophones. Can anybody tell me what they are other than my GMA student? What are the different types of saxophones that are around, the common ones? Don't be shy. Anybody know what this one is? No? This is an alto saxophone. Um, and it's a little bit like the voices. There's a soprano saxophone. There's a tenor saxophone and a baritone saxophone. And then Sax was um, a bit of a mad inventor, and he had um, instruments going off in different directions. He had a sopranino saxophone, and a bass saxophone, and a contrabass saxophone, and a sub-contrabass saxophone. Look, those instruments, um, some of them uh, have been built and exist, but uh, the, the four most common ones are the, the soprano, alto, tenor, baritone. And as a, a saxophonist, you're expected to be able to play all of them. You can maybe you know, focus on one or the other, but really, you have to be able to play them all. So talking to the composer about, you know, what do you hear and, and, and what, what are you thinking for this piece? Is it more of a tenor saxophone piece or an alto saxophone piece? Sometimes I will steer the composer in one direction or the other. Um, if we're doing a tour and I don't really want to have to lug a baritone saxophone around America or wherever we're going, 
um, I might encourage them to think about one of the other instruments. Um, we have done that. It just means usually, like the piano player has to pick up a piano and just play whatever they get. I usually have to borrow an instrument and do that. Um, most of the repertoire for the instrument was written for the alto saxophone, which is the one I just held up. Um, so there is a preponderance of repertoire out there. So I, you know, I certainly have been encouraging composers to think about the tenor and the soprano saxophone as well. Um, so once that's decided, then they want to kind of know about the, all the different sounds that the saxophone can make. So often I'll sit down with the composer and just play. Um, that might be some repertoire that I've been working on, or it just might be, you know, just some different sounds. They want to know the different timbres and the different possibilities of the instrument. So there's all kinds of articulations that can be demonstrated and there's different techniques such as circular breathing and there's different sounds such as multiphonics, multiple notes at once. Kind of, I suppose, what have been considered as contemporary techniques these days, it's, it's becoming just part of the instrument lexicon. So once they've decided and they've done all that kind of stuff, and we're back, you've got to be careful what you do. You sneeze into your instrument, they might really like it and start writing for it. So watch out. Um, uh, if I can't meet with the composer, then um, it'll be a recorded thing. So uh, the composer will say, can you show me all of those different sounds, the slap tongue sounds when it's short and long in the low register? So I'll sit down and record it and, and email it off. Um, one uh, composition that we did, I did this, uh, he said, can you show me all the multiphonics? So I sat down and, and, and you know, did them over and over again until I got them all down sent them off, and then he sent the piece back about three months later, and I was like, oh, this piece is impossible. You know, I can't play it. And he just said, well, you shouldn't have sent me that stuff, you know. <laughs> I was like, your fault. Um, so obviously, you know, I could play them, so I just had to practice, um, and it worked. So um, that's the initial steps, and then once the composer's gone away and, and started writing and got their inspiration, often they'll, um, they'll want to do a little workshop. We'll get, meet together with um, David, the pianist, and myself, um, and we'll sit down, and they might have a couple of ideas, maybe a line or two, uh, or a couple of bars, and we'll try out some ideas at the piano just to see whether these sounds that they're hearing or imagining are coming out in the piece. Um, Again, not all composers are like this. Some composers, literally, we get nothing until we get the piece, and then that's it. But um, it's much more interesting, I think, in collaborative process if we're in the room with them, because then we feel like we can contribute and give them some ideas. And, well, you know, you're thinking about this, but how about we try it from this angle, and we can kind of massage things and make it maybe even more idiomatic, too. So, uh, okay, um, so we have some demonstrations and then some workshops. Um, then it can take, who knows, sometimes it can take a year for the piece to, to materialize or a version of the piece. Sometimes it can be months. It really depends on how busy the composer is and what they're doing in their lives. We start getting drafts of the music. Um, you could have up to, I think we've had up to like 19 different versions of a new piece of music that we, each time it's not radically different, but it's different in some way, shape, or form, and we have to relearn it. So then we have to learn the music, obviously, and then David and myself, uh, when we're doing the saxophone piano duo, we have to uh, rehearse, so work out how to put it together. And then uh, we start recording some of those rehearsals, and then we'll send that back again to the composer. Um, if we can get a composer, they're local, and we can have them to hum, come and listen to rehearsal, that's obviously ideal. But, um, but these days, it's so easy to record, um, we can just set up a little recorder in the room and send them off snippets so they can hear what's going on. Um, often, uh, you know, to follow up on that, there's a lot of emailing going on too. Sometimes Skype and video conferencing. Um, not, not really for rehearsals, but more for face-to-face -to, -face to asking questions. So, okay. Um, and then when we have that composer coming to a rehearsal, um, it's fantastic. Um, it really, you know, brings the piece to life for us, and then they start telling us what they're actually thinking. We can get inside the piece a little bit more. Um, this is kind of the ideal world. Um, this uh, recent project that we did, we, we compose, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it in a minute, but we worked with Mexican composers as well as Australian composers. And um, we did lots of emailing backwards and forwards, but you know, often it wasn't until we were 10 minutes before the performance and we were having a little run through in the hall that the composer was able to first hear the piece. And then usually they have to bite their tongue. Because <laughs> if they hear something that they don't like, it's almost too late at that point. Um, but we try to be flexible, take things on board. Um, and then after we've um, you know, had these performances and the first performance has gone out, there's usually more revisions. 
that come onto the piece. And then hopefully we're performing the piece in multiple places. We, take, we keep revising and sending performances backwards and forwards. So the piece is an evolution. The world premiere is great, but it's often not until maybe four or five performances later that the piece is really finished. Okay, time for a new slide. All right, I made the things shake because my kids were helping me do this. <laughs> they, they really like those things. Um, the, as uh, Matthew was mentioning, uh, these are the three CDs that I've um, put out um, and since really, I suppose since I came here at the conservatorium, um, I started working on them back then. They, they didn't materialize until I think about 2012. Um, the duo sax was actually um, all saxophone duets, so two saxophones, partly recorded in the States and partly recorded here, in, actually in this hall. Um, primarily made up of, um, well, there's some standard repertoire for saxophone and then there's some new pieces on there. Australian Portrait on the far left is all compositions by Australian composers all new music. Uh, and the one in the middle, Incandescence, is a project around uh, music by women composers. So I think it's important for us to theme what we're doing and our research and to theme not only the CDs, um, but uh, well, I suppose the, the concerts as well. Um, because, it, well, for a marketing perspective, it's easier for the, um, to be a cohesive idea, a cohesive concept. Um, and also for when we're, we're trying to promote our concerts. It's easier to say new Australian music than to say, come along and hear a saxophone recital. There might people, be people that are interested in hearing Matthew's music who wouldn't really be interested in hearing a saxophone, but they might come anyway <laughs> if they think it's Australian music. So, um, so yes, let's see him. So to make these happen, the CDs, um, and to get the recordings happening and to get these composers um, writing for us, grants are a big factor in what we do. I've been very lucky here at the conservatorium um, to, to get a, a, a couple of internal grants. So those are grants that are um, done by the faculty um, of music here and you have to apply for them and you have to have a project that you want to do and then you get chosen. So I was uh, lucky enough to get a couple to two of those um, CDs through CD recording grants. Um, and also um, external grants too. Um, Last year, um, or two years ago um, now, uh, we received a, a DFAT grant, so Department of Foreign Affairs and Trading, and it is the, there's different branches, and the one that we worked with was the Council of Latin American, no, of Australian Latin American Relations. It shortens to Koala, which is kind of nice. <laughs> I can never remember it. Um, and that meant that we were able to um, commission uh, and pay the composers uh, and we were able to travel to Mexico. It meant that we were able to do concerts over there. Um, it meant that we, and then when we came back to Australia, we were able to travel around the country and present those concerts too. So let's see here. I think I want to move ahead a little bit because we're going to play for you. Um, once this, the concerts have been done, for research, we really need to get some kind of uh, review done, whether it's a review of the performance or, or a review of the recording. Um, I don't know about my colleagues, but I find it very difficult to get people to come to live music to review concerts. Um, unless you're uh, already a, a major um, you know, a mover and shaker on the scene and you're performing in the Utzen room or um, somewhere high profile, it's quite difficult to get right up in the age or in the city morning herald so um, what we have done obviously we think recording is really important so the the, the cds it's, it's it's a lot easier to get those um, reviewed and in particular if you take the lead and you send them out yourself the recording companies they will send out um, cds to different places but if you have a contact at abc or if you know somebody that um, writes reviews it's much easier as it was to get pieces commissioned if you know a composer it's easier to get reviews if you know a reviewer so it doesn't always work that way sometimes it just happens but um, peer review is a very important part of the whole process again if we were doing a book or we were doing a, um, a chapter in a book um, those uh, things are often peer reviewed by the very nature or a journal article in particular so, okay, um, I'll quickly talk about this. I just briefly mentioned it before, the Mexican Connection. This was our concert um, tour that we did um, last year, 2015. And it's our latest project 
um, that we're still involved in. And we're gonna kind of do a little bit of it today. Um, as I mentioned, we did all the commissioning and we, we met with the composers. We're very lucky in that um, on faculty here at the conservatorium, we have Eduardo Diaz Munez. And he is a very well respected compose, uh, conductor and a Mexican conductor. So when we told him that we were doing this project, he said, yes, 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 I know many, many composers. He gave us a huge list of suggested composers to check out. And maybe there was 30 or 40 names on there which was great for us because then that meant that we had a starting point, that we could go and do our research and we could kind of find out who we liked and which music we wanted to head towards. Then we started comp uh, contacting composers. We had a few of them saying, thank you very much, I'm very flattered, but I'm too busy, the timeline's not right for me. Um, but for the most part, we were very lucky in the composers that, we, that agreed to be a part of this project. The other half is the Australian half and um, again, we were very lucky in that those uh, composers, um, Paul Sarsic um, and Miriama Young and Catherine Lakuda, they were all acquaintances of, of ours and they were all willing to be a part of this project. Paul Sarsic is an interesting one in that when I um, first contacted the record label to put out one of my first CDs, um, I got this email back saying, are you the Michael Duke from Victoria? And I was like, um, yes, that's where I grew up. And, it turned out that Paul Sarsic, um, who I had no idea was on the other end of the email, I just emailed the company, uh, was one of my teachers at the Victorian College of the Arts while I was down there. So we did the CD, we went to the UK, we, we played a concert in Australia House, he came, he heard the concert, he liked the music, and we said, you should write a piece for us. And he got excited and he did, so he was part of the project. So these. It's all about networking, music being a musician and, and being willing to, I suppose, um, think about who you know and be willing to meet new people and to network. Okay, so what else do I need to talk about this project? Um, we're at the point now that we have recorded everything and it's all in lots of takes and we're slowly putting the editing together. And then, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully by the end of the year, oh, well, definitely by the end of the year, we will have a new CD of all this music. So one of the pieces, uh, we had a composer, Gabriela Ortiz, and uh, we really wanted her to be a part of the project because we thought that her music was fantastic. And she said, oh, I really want to do it too, but I have this other project and I don't know that I can get it ready in your timeline. We looked at how much music we had and decided we had enough for the, um, for the concert series, for the touring that we were gonna do around Australia and in Mexico, and that maybe she could write the piece and it, we would put it on the CD. So she did, and we got the piece, and we really liked it, but it's never been performed in public. So, drum roll. Oh, there's some photos. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. This is just different photos of us working with composers around Australia and in Mexico some of the radio broadcasts that we did. David, if you would like to come to the stage, we're going to give the world premiere of um, Mambo Ninon by Gabriela Ortiz. So, Mambo Ninon. I'll just read her, oh no, I don't have them here, oops. Um, I'll tell you just briefly about the piece. Uh, Ninon um, is referring to a dancer, actress, singer from the 1930s and 40s. And she was a Cuban, but she, um, she moved over to Mexico. And she, uh, she was very hugely popular um, in Latin America um, back then and even today. If you kind of think of um, I Love Lucy and Desi Arnaz, and you think about Desi Arnaz's band, you know he had that big Cuban um, big band that would often feature, it was that kind of music that she was involved in. So lots of, um, lots of rhythms, lots of mumbo, and lots of different types of, um, of Latin American um, songs. So, excuse me. So she, she's taken, I suppose, the essence of some of that and then she's rolled it into um, some more contemporary sounding things, but I think it's a very accessible piece. I hope you enjoy it.
So that kind of also ends my um, talking portion, except that I would like to open it now uh, up to questions. If anybody has any questions about the whole process. Yes, down the front. Um, I'm just wondering, could you extend it down to a, a bass line? Could you just have a bass line? A bass saxophone? So the baritone, but not the yeah, well, the baritone is one of the more common instruments, but there is a bass saxophone. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm, definitely. Ah, uh, okay. Well, um, there was a point when they were more common. Um, back in the 1920s and the 19-teens, they were kind of um, part of uh, concert bands. And, but today, you don't see them as much. They're too heavy, <laughs> too hard to lug around. Yeah. 
Any other questions about anything? Yeah. Uh, for a well, I think the best advice is that you um, pursue your passion in terms of what you're doing. In, in other words, it's a bit vague. For, for me, my passion was about doing new music and about um, performing. So when I have to do research, it's an easy no-brainer. So um, instead of trying to, I suppose, smash that you know, peg into the wrong hole, uh, I try to find ways to make my research match what I want to be doing anyway, or what I'm doing match my research. Does that make sense? So they marry together instead of trying to take something that's really not research and trying to twist it until it becomes research? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, Josh. Yeah, no, it can it can fall under any of the categories. Um, that, yeah, as far as I know, definitely. I mean, I, I've certainly put in um, my own arrangements. I haven't composed anything, but they kind of fall in that category. Um, but yeah, no, you're not you're not. Um, I'm not uh, railroaded into doing this. I could do any of the different categories. I just have to make sure that. And some of the, sometimes you do something that kind of splits across different categories, and you can kind of put a percentage on how much you want them to consider each category. So yeah, you can do anything. And you know, in terms of innovation and, and, and composing and writing, you know, on the instrument, I mean, what we're playing is, is it's new music, it's brand new, it's never been heard before. But a lot of the techniques that you're hearing have been used before. Um, it's not experimental music in that per se. And that certainly falls under the, and it's not really answering your question, I'm just talking about something else. That <laughs> That, that certainly falls under the, um, the research heading, um, but you know, I, I suppose you, you create your own path and, and end up going in the direction that you'd like to go. Um, we, we don't head towards the experimental music side of things as much, person, um, just because that's what we do. Then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the university? Yeah, um, well, that's a very good question. I'm not sure why the university lets us do that. I'm glad they do, though. <laughs> I, I, think, I think part of it is that musicians are not often just in one little um, area, you know, not just a performer, or sometimes the composers are also performers. Um, and, um, you know, we, we record as well as perform. You know, we, we're doing lots of different hats, I suppose, and some of us are musicologists as well. Um, and uh, because I, the music is such a um, so hard to pin down in general, maybe that's why it's been left a bit more wide open for people. Um, I, I think if you're researching and contributing something innovative to the field, then yeah, yep. It doesn't I'm not I'm not just it doesn't say saxophone research. That's just my field that I the conduit that I do it in. Yeah. Sure. Yes, at the front, sorry. Is there an even balance of gender globally of uh, female saxophonists and, um, and composers and performers? Um, I wouldn't say that it's even balance. Um, there's, there are lots of uh, phenomenal um, female performers and composers. Um, and I think um, there's an awareness that there should be, you know, a uh, balance. But I think as things currently stand, there's probably more male performers, you know, versus female. Um, and one of the most popular, uh, most uh, uh, successful saxophonist is a female, um, an Australian, Amy Dixon. She's paving uh, a new path for all of us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Definitely. You don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much for your presentation today. Yeah, thank you. Cheers.